worship you, O my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my Lord, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Why don't you stand together and we'll all sing it. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Rejoice, take joy, my Lord, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Sweet, holy spirit. Heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Can y'all say amen? Let me see it, please. I'm the old man around here as far as speaking goes. And uh, so if I get sidetracked or lose my way, you can all just say, yeah, he's an old fella. Don't worry about it. But the text that Teresa gave me for this week, uh, she didn't want to preach on because it's about circumcision again. And, uh, and when I first started reading this text, I said, good Lord, why did you have Moses write these words? <laughs> what do you possibly have? that can be edifying to us in reading this. Well, I thought about, after we read it here, I thought about saying, well, maybe we should have a circumcision today. And Jim was gonna volunteer to come up, and, but no, he wouldn't do it, so he backed out. But this, this whole text is so foreign to us, but yet it has to do with the covenant that God made with Abraham. And this is a continuing of that covenant, and it was required in ancient times. Uh, so that's kind of the background of this. And uh, we're going to read chapter 34 uh, of Genesis. And um, you have to put up because I misread things, and you can figure it out probably because it'll be in the background before me too. But uh, I use the New King James. I've used it for many years, and I like it. So uh, as we go through this text, it talks about lust, rage, deception, greed, family conflict, anger, murder. And I first went through this and I went, oh, Lord, what do you, what do you want me to talk about when we look at this? So you can follow along with me as I read it. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah and the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Give me this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard... Uh, excuse me, and Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with the livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, 
went out to Jacob to speak to him. And the words of Jacob came in from the field, excuse me, the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and angry because of what he had done. A disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. A thing which ought not to be done. But Hamar spoke to them saying, the soul of my son, Shechem, longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves so that you shall dwell with us in the land and shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, acquire possessions for yourselves in it. And Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes. And whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me uh, ever so much dowry and gift, and I will according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, the daughter, his sister. And they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one of you uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. You will become as we are, and every male of, your, of you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and you will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you do not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. And their words pleased Haman and Shechem, Shechem, Shechem Hamor's son. So, uh, so the young men did uh, not delay to do the thing uh, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, these men are at peace with us. Therefore, let us dwell in the land. Let them dwell in the land and trade, uh, trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us make, take their daughters to us as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on the condition will men consent to dwell with us to be one people. Uh, for every male among us must be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and their every, uh, every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gates of the city heeded Hamor and Shechem, his son. Every male was circumcised. All who were out uh, of the gate of the city, who went out of the gate of the city. Now it came to pass in the third day, when they were in, the, uh, in pain, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, being his brother, Dinah's brother, uh, each took a sword and came boldly into the city and killed all the males. They killed Hamar and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because of their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in their field, and all their wealth, and all their little ones and their wives they took captive. They plundered even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have touched, excuse me, you have troubled me, making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. And I shall be destroyed, myself and my household. What on earth does that have to do with us, huh? I thought about having all the men come up here and make sure everybody's circumcised today. And uh, that didn't go over. Teresa said I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I studied, actually studied this, and, and there's a lot of stuff even today. Uh, 
when adult males are circumcised today, it's a major, major process. And indeed, days three through five, the pain increases immensely. Interesting that this very text speaks of that, in that great pain, the men were just not able to fight. So why did God do that? Why did God allow that? Why did God let the people of Israel deceive, go against Jacob's word? The, the boys learned really well about deception from their daddy, didn't they? Daddy was a deceiver. That was his name, Jacob the deceiver. Well, as I looked through this, I came to the conclusion that there's something else going on. For one thing, there's a sovereign hand of God on the people of Israel. God, all through the Old Testament, and we'll see that also in the future with the nation of Israel, I believe, God chose the nation of Israel to bring about this Messiah. And he protected the nation of Israel. Now, I don't know what God would have done had Jacob and Simeon not did what they did, but he would have done something to protect his people and keep them separated. And by the way, that's where we're going to go today is this whole principle of separation. As I look at this, and I address all of us, please understand that I'm in the same boat. I desire so much to simply please God. Our music today was so inspiring in that reference. It's just the, about worshiping God. And we so often get lost in the details, even in the Christian life. But here in this text, there's something that's very important that happens to not be in verse 35, in chapter 35. In the last verse of chapter 34, God says in his word, um, last verse of 33, I'm sorry, that Jacob erected an altar there and called it El Elhe Israel, which is God, the God of Israel. Interesting, this text begins with Jacob building an altar. We're going to spend some time on that today. Now, these altars were used for either uh, sacrifice of animals, blood, or in some cases, uh, all through the Old Testament as well, it was a sacrifice of incense and, and pleasant aromas to the Lord. In chapter 35 of Genesis, chapter 35, verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise, Go to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now, interesting that this text, which is full of terrible things, is surrounded by building an altar to the Lord. You have to keep in mind that these believers in this text of the Old Testament, they didn't have the Mosaic law yet. They didn't have the word of God printed in their hearts or, or written in any way. Moses hadn't written it yet. They were just kind of simply wandering around literally in the wilderness. But the one thing Jacob did, which started all this, was he didn't obey God. God told him to go to Bethel to the house of his father and his brother. He didn't go there. He went to Shechem. Now, when you get to chapter 35, what did we just read? Oh, uh, he built an altar and what? Obeyed God and went where he was supposed to be in the beginning with. So think about this even in our own lives. Sometimes we simply fail God for one way or another, and we, we need to say, I think we need to have some altars in our own lives. We need to have times where we can come and say, God, I want so dearly just to please you. Seek him with our hearts. We should be the most holy and committed people of God that have ever lived in God's redemptive history. This text, which we just read, took place somewhere around 1900 BC. Maybe farther than that. 
I believe Abraham was called around 2100 B.C. and this would be his children and grandchildren. They were 2,000 years before Christ. They didn't have this. They were just kind of wandering around, offering sacrifice and trying to obey God with the circumcision, which God did as a covenant relation with the nation of Israel. So as I look at this text, I thought, God, why did you put this here? <laughs> You're probably all wondering that too, right? You know, one of the things that I saw out of all this more than anything else was the sovereign hand of God on his people. In fact, if you go through all of Scripture, uh, from the call of Abraham especially on, God's people were protected and corrected by God. And he had his sovereign hand on them all the way up to the point for, for the protection of the birth of the Lord Jesus and the purity of who he was. And I believe, I think this New Testament says this, the book of Revelation supports it. Romans chapter 11 speaks of how God will fulfill his promises to Israel because of the patriarchs, the fathers. God promised Abraham these things, he will do it. You know, the Lord Jesus fulfilled many prophecies in his first coming, but there's a whole bunch of prophecies in the Old Testament that haven't been yet fulfilled. God's going to do it because he's sovereign and they are still his people. They're set aside, but he's going to pick them up again. What about us? You know, the New Testament teaches that we also are under God's protection. New Testament says that before the foundations of the world, he has eternal plan of, of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus and the mysteries of godliness centered in the Lord Jesus and that those who are in him are eternally secure forever and ever. Not because of what you did, but because of what he did. God's sovereign hand is there. Turn with me if you have your Bibles and want to go to Ephesians chapter. Well, there's a lot of places we can see this. But Ephesians chapter 1 has some fun stuff in it. Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul speaks of these things. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Wow, that's so awesome. I don't think, by the way, that this is individual election. I think the election of scripture, this is me. You can take whatever position you want. It's up to you. But all of the election verses and all of these pronouns are plural. I give the illustration of an airplane that some of you laugh because uh, it's going to leave Chicago. <laughs> an airplane's going to leave Chicago. There's a lot of people on it because they're leaving Chicago these days. And when you get in that airplane, it's predestined to go to its destination. Let's say Nashville. Well, this text says something very similar in the whole text about it before the foundation of the world. God chose those who would be in the Lord Jesus to be predestined. Once people get in the plane in Chicago and head, they're headed to Nashville. Well, once people are in the Lord Jesus, before the foundation of the world, those in him were chosen forever and ever, eternally secure, sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. It's called eternal security. We're eternally secure for one way and one way only. It's by believing in the person of the Lord Jesus. Believing that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again. It's not because of our works, it's because of his work. It's the same thing in this text in the Old Testament. God was sovereignly protecting the nation of Israel to bring about the person of the Lord Jesus through that great nation. Uh, Jacob was afraid. Jacob did the same thing many of us do. <laughs> he was afraid of what would happen. 
so much so that he didn't stand up on his own faith. Look at, if you have your Bibles again in Ephesians chapter 1, it says in verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he has made us accepted in the beloved. I mentioned in first service, and several people commented about it, I'm, I love language. I love, the Greek has a, it's the bunny trail, okay? The, the, the Greek is, in, is really involved and concerned with verbs. And in, and in the Greek, the, the noun or the subject is in the verb. Okay, it's all one word. We don't do that so much in English. But also, the Greek language is more concerned with action than timing. So, today we talk about time in our, in our verbs more than anything else. For instance, we say, I'm reading the Bible. That's a time thing right now. Or I have read the Bible or I'm going to read the Bible. Do you see how it's all about time? Well, the Greek is more interested in uh, action. And there's three voices in the Greek. This, I hope you don't mind me getting into grammar. I love grammar. Take it with, if you want to take it. If you don't want it, don't listen. There's three voices in the, in the Greek language. Passive, middle, and active. Active means I do it myself. Middle means I do it to myself. Or that whoever the verb is, that whoever the, the subject of the, of the verb is. And the third one is passive. That means it's done to us. Now listen carefully to this. Romans 5 says that we are being justified freely by his grace, which is in the Lord Jesus. That is a verb which is passive. And it's also a participle, which means it keeps on going. <laughs> so let's put the grammar on this. When it has an ing, usually in the English, it's a, it's a participle. It means it keeps on going. I am being justified freely by his grace, which is in Christ Jesus. I am presently and will continue to be Justified by his grace, which is in Christ Jesus, and it's something he did, not me. You get it? I stand before you justified before God Almighty, not because of what I do or don't do, but because of what he has done. It is finished. I heard several weeks ago, oh, it's been a month or two ago now. I went to a conference kind of thing that somebody was speaking, and they, and they said... It was awful. Let's start there, okay? This guy was, he was a very good speaker, but he spent the whole time saying that if you don't perform, you're not there. <laughs> That's what the Old Testament was all about. That's what the law was all about, was people trying to perform. Did they make it? Has anybody ever made it by performance? I grew up thinking, well, if I was good enough and if the good outweighed the bad, I might make it. No. As soon as God showed me, no, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift. If it's a gift, you don't earn it and you don't deserve it. How many people today give gifts and expect something in return? <laughs> we do, don't we? That's not what God did. God gave it freely. And so in the Old Testament, it's a testament of death. The New Testament is a testament of, there are two different testaments. In the New Testament, it's God's work of grace and redemption. And so I seek to please God. I seek to honor God. I seek to obey God, not because I'm earning anything. Simply because I want to please him. Now, Paul says in Romans chapter 2 something really interesting. He is a Jew, not that is circumcised in the flesh, but he is a Jew, and the, the thrust is he is a man of God, person of God, who has a circumcised heart. 
That's what we're going to talk about today, dear friends. Life is so dangerous and there are so many things that can trap us. Perhaps the greatest danger is to be assimilated into the world. That's exactly what was happening in Genesis 34. The tendency was there to, oh, we'll just intermingle with these people who are not part of the covenant relationship. We do that too, don't we? Sometimes we practice the same things that the world practices or think the same thing the world practices. God says very clearly in this text in 34, don't be assimilated into the world. And sometimes the person that is most interfering in assimilation to the world is not necessarily the devil. <laughs> sometimes it's ourself. Because our heart hasn't been committed to God. God's desire for us is to have a heart that is totally sold out to him. Those songs today were so good. God, my heart, I want my heart there. I want to obey you because my heart loves you. I had, a, I had one of the greatest dads that ever lived. I don't know. I hope you can relate with this. My dad was just the neatest guy. And my grandparents on that side especially were that way too. Just godly, gracious people. My dad used to put up with some of the most horrible things from me. I just think about it now, I think, oh, he was so good. Once when I was quite young, I built a tree house and my buddies and I were out there smoking grapevines. Do you ever smoke grapevines? <laughs> and my dad caught us. I was so embarrassed. I, was, I thought, oh, I'm gonna get whipped. You know what? My dad was just great. He never said a word about that. That was worse than if he'd have whipped me. And that was such a testimony to me of how good my, my earthly father was. And such a testimony to me of how awesome my heavenly father is. You know how many times we smoke grapevines in reference to God? <laughs> All of us. You all smoke grapevines in reference to looking at God, don't we? You're going to go away saying that pastor used to smoke grapevines. Poor guy. But I want us to see the importance of it's based on his love and his grace. Well, to continue the story, as I got older and into adulthood, I loved my dad so much I'd do anything for him. When he was 87, 85 to 87 years old, I used to drive from Michigan to Ohio. Dad would call and he'd say, hey, Doug, about time for a haircut. Every time he got ready for a haircut, you know what I did? I dropped everything and I drove to Ohio and spent two or three days with dad and we got our haircut. Wouldn't it be good if every time our heavenly father calls out to us, we drop everything and just do what he said? Not because we had to, because we wanted to, because we loved him. That's what God wants us to do in every aspect of our life. Now, these saints in the Old Testament, they just didn't have all those things, but how thankful we need to be for this example right here. All of the treacherous things that are in this text, there's lust, greed, deception, Family conflict, anger, murder, anything else you want to add to it. And yet God picked them up and took them forward. Now, I'm hoping that we don't fall into a lot of those categories here. But I do want you to know this. We, we often spend too much time focusing on how we fail God instead of focusing on how we want our hearts to just to be pure before God. I hope that's what you want, what I want. I don't have my notes here, but I haven't even looked at them yet. So you're just stuck, folks. I just started. We don't have to finish till one o'clock or so, do we? Huh? Huh? Say amen. Come on. No, no. 
So the text talks about the awesome power of God. How do we go about not allowing the world to pull us in and be assimilated? It's probably a lot of things, and they're not new to you. Most of this isn't new to you, but we need to commit ourselves to the power of separation. We have the power to be separate from the world. We need to commit ourselves to proper insulation that we have protected our, ourselves, our environment. We can do that. We don't have to be assimilated into the world. And we have to set our minds to being under the power of, of intention and purpose. We are, Ephesians 1 says, all through the text of Ephesians 1, that we are to be to the praise of the glory of his grace. Isn't that cool? To the praise of the glory of his grace. How many people do you know, and I, <laughs> we preachers are guilty of this more than ever, say, look at me, why didn't you arrive like me? You know that type? No, that's not God glorifying. Ephesians 1 says that all of us are here to bring praise to the glory of his grace. I have spent most of my adult life seeking simply to praise God for his goodness and grace. Not me. No way is it me. It's what he's done. I told the first service, if it weren't for the good Lord and my sweet wife, I'd probably be dead or in jail. Some of you would be too, wouldn't you? But the grace of God, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live righteously and sober in this present evil world. This man I heard several months ago was so convinced that if you're teaching grace, you're not very good at understanding what God wants out of you. I disagree with that. If you're not preaching grace, you're teaching the opposite of what God wants. The more we understand the graciousness and the goodness of God, the more power of the Holy Spirit works in our life. And it's only through His grace. Does anybody here think you deserve God's grace? I did a survey once early in my ministry. I said, I had it. Everybody in the church, I said, was, was anonymous, thank goodness. I said, are you pleased with where you are in your Christian life? Everybody except one person, <laughs> one person said he was pleased with his life. And I knew that man. No, we just don't make it, do we? has to do with God's love, God's grace working in us. It's the only thing that will ever redeem us. It's the only thing that will ever work. Well, God, why did you have Moses write this text? I don't understand. One of the reasons for the Old Testament and all of these illustrations is to give us examples, perhaps, of what not to do perhaps of what the human flesh is so capable of in contrast to what God has for us. God desires that we set our tent and our altar facing what he has, his people, his way, right here. That's why we gather together. That's why we have this fellowship and why we sing praises to him. You know, the ancient Jewish people uh, the rabbis teach this. I thought it was really fun. I, I love to study the rabbis. Their favorite saying for the Sabbath is, you probably already know, Shabbat Shalom, peace of the Sabbath. Rest in the Sabbath. Rest and peace in the Sabbath. And the Jewish people, after the Sabbath, for the next three days, 
would say, wasn't the Sabbath wonderful? The rabbis went around teaching this constantly. And for the next three days of the week, you know what they did? Oh God, we look forward to the Sabbath. <laughs> they spent their, their whole lives teaching and trying to practice, I'm sure. Some of them probably did. Centered around the Sabbath and their time and fellowship with God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? If we could have that mentality towards the first day of the week, Sunday. God, it looks, boy, when, when this whole pandemic happened, I just hated it. I wanted to be in church. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have our whole week centered around worshiping the whole, holy God of the universe? Recalling these songs and these praises that we look at even here today. That's a heart thing. It's not based on works. It's a heart thing. God looks at the heart. It's not all the do's and the don'ts. It's the heart. So these people here in Genesis 34, they need so desperately to experience the grace of God. I say this. If you don't get anything else today, get this. We today have more knowledge and more advantage than any people of God have ever had to live a godly life pleasing him. We've got the whole counsel of God. We've got example after example of how men failed God. We've got example example of how God continued to pick men up. We've got example of what God did in the reference to the cross. Do you know that? The Old Testament saints had, they didn't have any idea. Paul says in Corinthians that had they known what the cross was going to do, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't know. Do we? Do we know the depth and the meaning of what the cross has done? So when I read this text, I keep seeing a huge contrast between then and now. It's enormous. Now, we've all seen, I think, I hope we have, if we haven't, do it today, seen God work in our life, in our families. If you haven't, come to him right now. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and the Holy Spirit, God says the Holy Spirit will come into your life and fill you and seal you until the day of redemption. You know, it thrills my heart that Shorty and I are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Right, Shorty? Woo! No! <laughs> All of us, based on the awesome grace of God. No people have ever had that privilege. And until 1611, when the, New King, when the King James Bible was written, the commoner in English language, or for that matter, any other language, they didn't have the word. That's why the old cathedrals have the pictures that they could teach scripture by pointing at the pictures. They didn't have all of the resources that we have on, on our phones and the internet. And uh, Man, I, I could go to the internet and study circumcision. It was pretty cool. <laughs> They didn't have anything on their circumcision of the heart. I want you to know that. But God has, doesn't he? We have more available to us that we should be the most godly people that ever lived. I want that for all of us. I, I find that Our churches that I've had, always had, I told everybody they had the cream of the crop that we took people from every domination and put them together in the cream of the crop. I really believe that. You know that I've had people leave because they just couldn't buy this grace stuff. Friends, I'll tell you, there's nothing that magnifies the Lord Jesus more than bowing our hearts and minds 
and spirits and our whole being before the throne of grace. And there's nothing that's more powerful in our lives than God's throne of grace. He'll transform us and keep transforming us. I don't even know what's up here next. Let's look at it. (laughs) Casual Christians become Christian casualties. It's true. If we look at Christianity in a casual way, we're going to be a casualty. God doesn't want that in our lives. He wants us to go forward in the strength and might of his word. His word dwelling in us. If God has our hearts, our wants will change. When I was a young man, I always had a goal to be wealthy and retire by 45. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. You know why? Because God brought some beautiful Christian ladies into my life and business and taught me to seek God. And I remember it very faithfully as I was sitting in a church that I'd never been in before and an African was preaching on Romans chapter 8. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And I sat in my seat. I just accepted that. God came in and started changing my life. It's never stopped. I hope for us, friends, that you have that goal. It's centered on the power of his goodness in our lives. God wants his grace to empower us to be pleasing to him. I have to read a few things here. Even while we're running late, I want you to hear it. The law prohibits, grace invites and give. The law condemns the sinner, grace redeems the sinner. The law says do, grace says it's done. The law says continue to be holy, grace says it's finished. We're called saints. Saints means holy ones, sanctified ones. Hagias is holy. We, we are declared Holy ones. The law curses, grace blesses. The law slays the sinner. Grace makes the sinner alive. The law shuts every mouth before God. Grace opens the mouth to praise God. Come boldly to the throne of grace. The law condemns the best man. Grace saves the worst man. The law says, pay what you owe. Grace says, I freely forgive you all. The law says the wages of sin is death. And grace says, the gift of God is eternal life. Law says, the soul that sins shall die. Grace says, believe and live. God has one thing for you to do today, Believe. Believe him and rest in his work. The law reveals sin. It still does. Grace atones for sin. The law is a knowledge of sin. By grace, we have redemption from sin. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law demands obedience. Grace bestows power. To obey. The law was written in stone. Grace is written in the tablets of our heart. The law was done away with in Christ. Grace abides forever. The law puts us in bondage. 
Grace sets us free in the liberty of being his children, his sons and daughters. So friends, as we read this crazy text in Genesis 34, if you don't get anything else, thank God, especially you men today, (laughs) thank God that he's looking for a circumcised heart from all of us. Take our hearts and say, God, here's something I want want to give to you. Cut this part of my heart. You just see, it's, it's what's going on in here. Cut this part of my heart out, Lord. Replace it with you. That's God's desire, that he be first. If he's first, all those other things are very insignificant. If he's first, it doesn't matter what's going on in a political arena in our country or any other country. Scripture says that the Lord Jesus is on the throne. He controls who rules. And if that happens to be the worst liberal, nasty person like Nero of the Roman Empire or some of our politicians, it doesn't matter. God's in control. He wants that in our hearts. He wants grace to reign. I don't know what our country holds from the down the road. It's kind of fearful. But you know what? I know that the Lord Jesus could appear any moment and take us to be with him in glory. And I just want my heart to be right with him. I want to be what he wants me to be. You know, you got to suffer through the old man that has, you know, when you get to be my age, the brain cells start dying. I've got quite a few dead. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, he's alive. He wants to rule and be first in our hearts. Why don't you stand together and we're going to sing a special song by Lauren Dago and our sweethearts up here to sing it. Make God first today. Wherever you are, wherever you are in your life, say, oh God, I want you to be first.